Hello, good afternoon. I want to welcome you on behalf of the European Pain Federation to this uh, webinar uh, on pain management during the COVID-19 pandemic, where we will discuss the impact on patient care and the services. And it's great to have so many people from all over the world linked into this uh, webinar. We have over 464 uh, registrations. Um, we can take now 501 but we will, um, this um, um, webinar will be recorded and will be available to all the registered uh, participants. Uh, please do note that uh, there will be a recording, so uh, we will also rec take record of your questions and um, we will kick off with um, uh, explaining our new task force, which was uh, built uh, only a few weeks after the outbreak of the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And um, afterwards, we will uh, discuss uh, very specific points on the organizing of the organization of pain clinics uh, with uh, uh, Mary Pleef and uh, Luis Garcia Larea. And then two surveys were already performed, one based on the um, experience of professionals working in pain management and one related to how do patients experience um, these. And this will be discussed by uh, Dr. Aaron Bashkar and Dr. Silvio Brill, and also the president of the Pain Alliance Europe, Jörg van Grinsvent. And we will have plenty of time afterwards to have a Q&A. Please do note that on the right side in um, the indications of the GoToWebinar control panel, you will find a module called questions please put your if you have any questions question put it over there and we will take do our best to catch up to summarize the questions and to go um, into a hopefully live dis uh, lively discussion so uh, it's my honor to um, uh, hand over now to um, Roger Nex and I'm very happy that he accepted our invitation to take the lead in our task force. Hey everyone, it's Melinda from Ethic. I'm here today with Roger, to, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the newly created Ethic COVID-19 task force. Roger, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, Melinda. Um, my name is Roger Nags. I'm a clinical academic pharmacist from Nottingham in the UK, and I've been working in the area of, of pain for approaching 20 years. Wow, wonderful. Well, tell us a bit more about the EFIC COVID-19 task force. So the task force um, was started a um, few weeks ago, and the reason why um, it was felt that we perhaps needed um, some uh, a, a specific dedicated um, task force um, for EFIC was um, following some concerns around the use of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug ibuprofen um, when it was being used uh, to treat patients with a, a fever who had COVID-19 infection. COVID-19 is obviously uh, has affected us all as healthcare professionals and um, in our individual lives as well. And since the beginning of the year, there have been approaching 4,000 papers published in the scientific literature related to COVID-19. And there's no way anyone can uh, spend time reading through every uh, single paper. So we felt that there was a need to be able to produce a digest that was um, really focused on pain-related issues um, for the EFIC community. Wonderful. So now how can people find out more about the task force and its findings? So the task force has been um, working over the last couple of weeks and there is now a dedicated um, site on the EFIC uh, website that people can um, refer uh, two, and that is going to be um, updated on a regular basis when, as there are new papers that are published um, around 
um, COVID-19 and pain and also um, analgesics uh, and, and COVID-19 as well. Also, um, there will be, uh, as new papers are added, um, we will highlight these through uh, usual communication channels such as social media um, and you'll also perhaps see a uh, more frequent but uh, shorter newsletter updating members of the EPIC community um, as um, particularly um, relevant papers are published. Wonderful. In your opinion, how can people in the PIN community benefit from the task force? So the, 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 the main aim of the task force is to really provide a concise um, digest of relevant papers that are going to have an impact on your everyday um, clinical practice. And um, we'll, we'll also provide some uh, commentary around um, uh, the papers so that you can think about their, their impact in your everyday practice. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, Roger, and thank you for your work on the task force. Thank you. It's lovely to speak to you, Melinda. Good evening, everyone. Um, we are now going to hear from two members um, of the task force who um, are going to describe how pain clinics have had to um, change and, and reorganize their work. Uh, uh, over the last uh, few months regarding the pandemic. And although the original focus of the task force was very much related to drugs and to, um, and, and to medicine specifically, we're now beginning to expand into uh, other areas and um, include uh, information, uh, papers from other disciplines. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our um, first uh, member of the task force and our newest member of the task force, um, Mary O'Keefe, who is a um, physiotherapist uh, by background. She is a, uh, has been doing a postdoc um, research uh, position in Australia over the last couple of years and is currently working with EPIC through a Marie Curie fellowship. And she's going to describe to um, us uh, the impact that COVID-19 has had on uh, physiotherapy services and how they've had to adapt. Sorry, everybody, the pre-record doesn't seem to be playing, so I'll just go along and present.
Hi everybody, so I'm going to be presenting on telehealth for physio pain management and I'm just going to start with defining what telehealth is. So it's the delivery of healthcare at a distance using information and communication technology. The most popular methods are telephone and video conferencing, particularly Skype. So that's what physios have generally been using in the last while. And while it's very important at the moment is because there is recent research that people with pain have been suffering substantial impact during COVID-19, particularly if they had pain beforehand and if they had their surgeries deferred. So the first question physios often ask is, can you actually do a reliable pain assessment using telehealth technology versus face-to-face? -face? And the good news so far seems to be that we can. So based on the studies to date, when the assessment methods have been compared face-to-face, -face, it seems like you can reliably assess pain, quality of life and function. And for management, we also seem to be able to deliver guideline-based care using telehealth versus face-to-face. -face. So this includes exercise, education and pain coping skills. And this seems to be as effective as face-to-face -face physio methods. But the research is still needing to be done. There are higher quality trials needed. But this is uh, encouraging for physios that you can deliver the very same face-to-face -face interventions on, te on a telehealth type pla platform. And there has been some research, though it's a little small to date, just on how patients and physios respond to telehealth and are, are they satisfied with it and do they see it as an acceptable mode of care. And so far for the research done on hip and knee away patients, they seem to be happy with this method of care in comparison to face to face. Physios are open to it so far, but there hasn't been a lot of research. But the only downside is both physios and patients dislike the lack of physical contact. So there are some concerns there about what that might mean for their care and also expectations they have around management. And finally, I have some considerations before implementation for physios that people have been taking into account over the last few months. So if you're picking a platform, you need to make sure that it meets privacy and security regulations in your country and setting so that you're able to store and transfer medical information. Also, is the platform you pick, is it the method easy to use for your particular patients? So if you have people that maybe aren't experienced with technology or maybe older patients that aren't able to use the technology, please try and pick something that's easy or make sure somebody is at home to help them use the platform. Also, what are patients' expectations of telehealth? it's important to educate them on the evidence that they can get the benefits the same as face-to-face -face, so they have some expectation going into it. And also, what treatment are you aiming to deliver? If it's exercise, does the patient have enough space at home so they can safely do an exercise program? And if it's something like CBT or talking or reassurance treatments, is there adequate pri privacy at home or wherever they're doing the telehealth treatment? that confidentiality isn't breached. So they're the main considerations that are worth taking into account going forward, but also what people have been really trying to deal with over the last few months. And finally, I'll just have a slide on reading. So I will be completing physio research updates through the EFIC website. So just keep an eye on that link, the COVID-19 link, where I'll be updating um, commentaries as they become available. And I've just mentioned two research papers that have a lot of information on telehealth at the moment and have lots of useful references. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I would now like to um, introduce our second member of the task force, Professor Louis Garcia Larea, who is um, research director at the Centre for Neurosciences at the uh, University of Lyon, and he's also a member of the Neurological Hospital's Pain Centre. Um, he, um, in, in addition to these roles, he is the current editor in chief 
of the European Journal of Fame and um, is really to be commended for um, the uh, great news of its uh, recent increase in uh, impact factor to 3.5. And Louis is going to talk about some of the challenges regarding uh, uh, delivering pain services um, within a COVID environment. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Roger. It's a bit, it's a bit hectic. I think I don't know if it's my. Okay. Okay. So, uh, my idea is just during three, four minutes to speak about the the problem with uh, literature that we are having with this uh, COVID uh, thing. I don't know whether I can change the slides myself, so I should ask for that. Can I have the next slide or can I do it myself? I cannot do it myself. Okay, so uh, COVID has provided with a triad that is very dangerous for research. That is the mixing of uh, urgency of uh, money available for research and the possibility of rapid publication for many of our colleagues. And this is, uh, if you can keep with the slide, uh, I, cannot, I cannot move the slide, so you should this. Uh, so this gives rise to uh, uncontrolled reports to what is called repository literature. It means that uh, there are plenty of papers that have not been expertised or refereed by anyone, but they are in the literature and you can read it that if they were reliable. This leads, of course, to increase withdrawals, you know, some examples, and in fact, it's an intellectual mess. Go to the following, please. Can you go to the next? Yeah. So these are three examples. We, we shall not be dealing with the three examples uh, in depth, of course. It's just for you to remind uh, that this, these three points have been extensively discussed about the COVID and anti-inflammatory uh, non-steroidals, COVID and anti-conversion uh, enzyme because of the receptor ACE2, and of course, the big deal with the cytokine storm which seems to be the, the dogma. Now, if you put these three together, you get almost 900 uh, papers together. And in these 900 papers, you find everything and the contrary of everything. I, I put just two examples. You can find that, that it is advised to avoid the prescription of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And then in PubMed, the two lines uh, below, you can found that there are very promising clinical outcomes with the use of anti-inflammatory drugs for COVID-19. So what to do? One of the things to do, like if you can go further, is to have a, uh, the good references. For example, this is a paper that uh, arrived just uh, some uh, weeks ago, but it came from a society, a National Society for Experimental and Clinical Pharmacology. So you know that there is a consensus. There are people together that have discussed and have produced something that is consensual. It might be or not relevant, but at least it deserves being uh, read and discussed. And in this case, they are advising uh, especially no uh, interrupt a, a therapy with ibuprofen or with uh, ACE in case of, of COVID. So, if you want to go further, please, the next slide, you can also go to the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization website, which is quite well done, and then you can find also the consensual uh, statements, which in this case is on the same uh, side that this at the present, there is no evidence that there are severe adverse events events uh, affecting survival or quality of life in patients as a result of the use of uh, NSAIDs. So you choose the good literature or else you are really puzzled. Uh, if we go further, uh, this comes essentially because we are not uh, cautious enough when we try to draw conclusions from uh, mechanistic pharmacology. Mechanistic and theoretical pharmacology is important, it should be discussed, it should 
will be studied, but not every time translates into the clinics. And now with this COVID pandemic, we have used very interesting, very intellectually driving uh, ideas from mechanistic uh, pharmacology to put them immediately as if they were applicable. This is not the case. Another example, and I, I, I'll end with this, is the cytokine storm. We all believe it exists. We all believe, especially yeah. uh, people dealing in, in reanimation and ICU, that this is a problem. But is this a real problem in COVID-19? Up to now, it seemed to be the case. Uh, but nobody had take some time to compare the real plasma levels of cytokines, and especially interleukin-6, which is one of the most uh, popular, I might say, uh, and just compare with the gold standard, which is the level of cytokines in acute respiratory distress syndromes, ARDS, which is really cytokine storm. And then when you compare, you have in green uh, the there in green the COVID if you click they will appear just click once please click. <laughs> okay so you have in green the levels with the most uh, severe case of, of uh, COVID-19 and in red the levels in equivalent severe uh, levels in uh, ARDS and when you compare the levels of uh, cytokines in COVID are up to 200 fold lower than the levels in ARDS. So perhaps we are not dealing with a real, real storm, just like so the other tempest in a teapot. So what to do? Uh, but to do clinical work. This is a very recent paper uh, showing that blocking interleukin 6 apparently in just uh, 50 patients. This is not a big uh, deal, but there are 50 patients and there was no change in mortality, uh, no clinical improvement. So this is what we should do, just test things against uh, uh, control. What else next uh, is to consider that a pandemic it's no excuse to lower our clinical standards or our scientific standards. On the contrary, uh, a pandemic a scientific urgency should push us to combine our efforts and to triage out this type of literature that, has, that is of low value. And this we are not uh, doing uh, enough at this point. So what else? Like, go to the European Federation Pain uh, website because there is a task force behind trying to do exactly this, to try to consider which papers are able to provide useful information, which uh, ones can deserve being commented, and also to provide you with uh, literature that seems to be reliable, so you can do yourself your own idea about that. So this is the corollary, just uh, not only take care of yourself, but take also care of the literature you are uh, dealing with. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Luis. Um, I, I also want to congratulate you and your editorial team with the increase of the impact factor. It's a major achievement and it's because of your string it and uh, very uh, scrutinized um, uh, scientific uh, methodology that we uh, achieved this. So uh, congratulations. Um, I want to move on. Um, I'm sure that in the background our team is trying to fix, uh, find a solution for the sound um, of the pre-recorded uh, presentations and I hope they will be able to do this within the next 10 minutes otherwise we will have to uh, perform a change of program. Uh, nevertheless, uh, let's try if we uh, this this uh, um, will will happen. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Arun Vashkar from the Imperial College of London. He's a pain consultant. He's also the current president of the uh, British Pain Society, and he will team up with uh, Dr. Silvio Brill. He's uh, also uh, a pain specialist. He's the director of the Institute of Pain Medicine um, at the Medical Center in Tel Aviv. 
um, and he's also our uh, honorary secretary of the European Paint Federation, so member of the executive board. Um, and they will discuss uh, the results of our EFIC survey on pain management during COVID, focused on the healthcare providers. Please, uh, Silvio will kick off. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining us for uh, this webinar. Uh, we move very fast at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and started the, our task force and also start to understand what's going on in the area of pain management in Europe and start this, um, this survey. Uh, more than 400 uh, healthcare uh, pain uh, people respond uh, to us. Next uh, slide, you can see the the number of people. And we find out that more more than third of the pain clinics are completely shut down during during uh, the last few months of the pandemic. Next slide, please. And also, we understood then almost we couldn't see any patients. Only 4% of our uh, practice have been face-to-face -face consultations. So we we move quite stuff, quite fast to a virtual phone or tele tele telemedicine in order to uh, to help our uh, our patient. You can see the how 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 we we we, we um, who, uh, shared our pra practice with our patients. Third of uh, our practice was, was uh, used to treat pain, uh, cancer pain, and also we we uh, we did a lot of interventional pain management despite all the talks and, and the literature, as uh, Louis said, regarding the the steroids and non-steroidal uh, medication. As as you can see, 70% of our practice have been tele telemedicine and video consulting uh, patients. More please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we ask our uh, our partners if they are treating any COVID-19 survivors in the pain cleansing, and we find out that and in the first three months we couldn't see more or less no no uh, no uh, pain no COVID survivor in the pain clinic. So we don't have yet. Then I, I want to point yet any problems with, with these uh, survivors. Probably we need to, re to renew our uh, our survey in the next months to see if, if there will be any chronic uh, pain problems in the pain uh, in the COVID uh, survivors. Next slide, please. So what are we doing uh, now? We asked because we've seen all the story in the literature in the uh, uh, against and pro using end stage steroids, uh, epidural steroid injection, and opioids. As you can see, there is a everyone is doing whatever they they believe or, or they want. There is no uh, uh, from more or less third of the everyone is doing the same. I I don't feel comfortable or I have no doubts. It's more or less the same uh, story. Uh, we are not changing our daily practice based on the what we know we know because we don't know nothing new our our days please and uh, uh, the main issue we, we ask also our partners our colleagues if they feel uh, any anxiety dealing with uh, their patients we don't know if they are COVID patients or no. And we found that around more than 60% of our healthcare uh, partners are worried and are, uh, are um, feeling anxiety treating patients at all and uh, patients uh, with COVID in particular. So we need, and they are also with severe anxiety. So we need to treat ourselves uh, in order to better treat our, uh, our patients. We need to take care of our teams and to to increase the the confidence uh, of our self treating uh, treating patients and uh, so uh, what we learn from our survey that we do have problems and do, we do change our pain practice from talking with the patients and, and touching the patients to 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 video screens so it's completely different 
trying to understand feelings of patients and, and we are moving um, moving quite fast in another way and probably is going to stay for a while this 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 new way of treating patients i uh, i'm giving the the scene to my uh, partner arun please uh, share with us our thoughts we we, we try to, we, we are trying to 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 give you the opportunity to understand our thoughts and fears for the near future arun please thank you silvia um first of all um Thank you to Bart and the executive board and the COVID task force for setting this happen. I'm going to talk about the potential challenges, roadblocks, and a way forward when we are asked to open up the pain services. Could I have the next slide, please? So first of all, I mean, um, uh, Sylvia mentioned about almost 90% of people working within pain clinics who have responded to the survey has got an element of anxiety about dealing with it. But despite that, 50% of colleagues within pain clinics have been redeployed for direct COVID duties in various theaters. The others have been actively involved in management duties and also taking difficult decisions on allocating resources. And a lot of people also continued supporting the pain services very, with very limited resources during these difficult times. So on behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you to all of the colleagues out there who have done a sterling job over the last few months. Next slide, please. So the challenges we are facing when we were asking about opening services, and I am talking from a UK perspective, but I'm sure this is very similar in most other countries as well. We've just come out of lockdowns. We still have got social distancing rules, even though that is getting narrower. We have been shielding our vulnerable patients but a lot of them are patients in our clinics and they want to come in for treatment the hospital capacities have been restricted because we are still dealing with covid patients and we mentioned about the anxieties are not limited to professionals but even more with the patients and the public they're also worried about the economic impact and how things are going to be when job losses are on the horizon we are have got embargo on international travel it's very much restricted what would happen when that gets opened up? And we are already talking about second peaks, pressures during winter, and how long this pandemic could do. And this is what we are being faced when we have been asked to reopen our pain services. Next slide, please. So the priorities we are giving during the COVID time was mainly for cancer pain, acute emergencies where patients have got debilitating pain due to a, a sudden onset aspect, Mobility issues where people can't mobilize or cannot even do a proper cough and clear their chest in COPD patients. And then psychological issues that have arisen due to uncontrolled pain. As Sylvia mentioned, when the initial survey was done, we haven't seen the widespread pain which a lot of post-COVID patients are talking about. I'm sure somewhere along the line, they would come think about our fibromyalgia patient group who probably will have flare-up of symptoms, not only due to COVID, but also that their activities have been restricted. We've been also supporting essential workforce by law enforcement agencies um, and ambulance personnel and medical staff to, uh, with their pain problems so that they can go back onto the front line. And I mentioned again, the challenge we have with the shielded patients who are vulnerable is to provide COVID protected pathways, which involves COVID screening and making sure that they have a COVID free zone within the hospital to come and go. But again, we can do that within the hospital, but the government policy on social distancing and personal protection is very much, they're opening up in the UK. Now it's a one meter social distancing, which is more or less very much what we do normally. So we have those challenges to deal with. Next one, please. So how are we doing it? And what, what are the way forward we are looking at is, we can have virtual clinics. Uh, we are doing it using software like Attend Anywhere, MS Teams, Skype, Zoom. And as Mary mentioned, we need to have got some privacy and uh, patient data security in all these things, which are not always easy. I still find that uh, ringing up the patient is probably the most reliable because they answer the phone rather than uh, play with the software, which they are not familiar with. We've been encouraging self-management strategies as much as possible and see whether we can use 
the support of the family doctors, local rehab service, and the local pharmacies to deliver care based on our advice. We're trying to make follow-up arrangements within the primary care as much as possible. We are looking at having virtual meetings with the doctors who can discuss a group of patients and then they can impart the advice on medications, et cetera, to them. But we also have got uh, facilities to fast track potential red flags for urgent assessment. Otherwise, we are trying to uh, restrict any visits without a very good reason. We have been advocating for one-stop clinics, and one of the things is to avoid repetition of referrals. So we need a triage, which is done in collaboration with primary care, whether the patient absolutely needs face-to-face -face consultation. We're trying to reduce it somewhere between 20 to 30% of total referrals. We need to find out COVID screening and pathways as per local policy so that patients can come in safe. The assessment has to be multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Otherwise, there will be repetition. We don't want to... Uh, we want to avoid that. We are trying to coordinate with other colleagues and see whether we can deliver an MDT package within that consultation. And we, we are even trying to look at delivering a diagnostic procedure and then do the definitive procedure at the same sitting so that the patient avoids multiple clinical contacts. I don't want to get into the restricted use of steroids, but again, other than inflammatory pathology, like an acute radicular pain, we have already moving towards using less and less of steroids, maybe this is a good time to look into that because the evidence base for repeated steroid injection is wearing thin at the moment. Next slide, please. So um, the EFIC has started the COVID task force and created this webinar to speak to you. And I think this conversation should continue. We need to know about what are the issues you are facing in your country, in your region. And we are more interested in finding out how did you solve these problems? And can we share this with colleagues from other countries so that they can have more efficacious way of dealing with their problems? Do you think COVID would influence delivery of healthcare in the future? And if that's the case, how should pain management adapt to these changes? I think it's a wider discussion, but I think it will happen and we need to tackle it proactively. There are several resources on the EFIC website and um, Roger has done a sterling job in coordinating and putting those uh, two um, literature up to date. And thank you, Luis, as well. But we would also like to hear from you. How else would you like us to look into supporting you? I will hand back to Bart. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, Silvio, and, and Aaron, for this account. And, um, uh, I want to encourage everyone uh, who's participated in the webinar, there were uh, open questions, please uh, use the, the question um, box in the control panel to address your questions, where our team is looking at it and, and gathering it so that we, we can share also your experiences with the whole group and address questions. Um, I'm looking forward now to um, the account of the, the patient's perspective because um, uh, we now heard what was happening around, especially in, in, in pain clinics and in specialized care. But nevertheless, uh, do, we shouldn't forget the central actor and the central stakeholder in this whole story, which is the patient. And um, therefore, uh, we work together with the Pain Alliance Europe and we very closely work together. They're actually based in, uh, have taken office also in our office. So there is a very close uh, relationship with the, the patient uh, organization. And their president, uh, Joop van Grinsven, he couldn't attend this webinar, but he pre-recorded um, an account of the survey they, they performed um, on the uh, experiences of patients related uh, to the whole COVID crisis. And so I do hope that our team managed to get the sound uh, fixed and let's give it uh, a try. Please, uh, Melinda and Sarah, start up the pre-recorded uh, video. Okay, I do see the picture, 
but I can't hear the sound yet. Okay, I will step in here. Please, um, you noticed already that uh, there is a technical issue with the sound. Um, we will take care that everyone who registered will get uh, the slides and we will make a new link with a proper version of this presentation. Um, nevertheless, it's useful to run through the... Can I get the slides back, please? Because uh, these, these data are important. So, um, and... Could you please put on again? Yes. So 
uh, you see that during this uh, survey, which was discussed also with us as um, uh, European uh, Pain Federation, so uh, we had uh, also an, an in-depth discussion what to access and um, I'm very grateful to Kevin Valls who actually volunteered to take care of the, the methodology and the, the question and he will take care also of the scientific um, uh, evaluation of these data. Um, Jop van Greenspan, you couldn't hear him, it's, it's clear, but um, there was also a very focused question on the access to the resources and um, there was actually, and I can confirm this also for Belgium, a very poor rating of information received from the government. So there were clearly from the government side, there was also uh, an issue, family doctor, healthcare specialist and, and patient association. And um, so there was a, a very poor score on this level. The most frequent types of help needed was the, the, the general access. And as uh, has been shown by Silvio and Aaron, the, most of the pain center closed down during the, the lockdown uh, episode. Um, and therefore, this was a, a major challenge for our uh, chronic pain patients. Can we have the next slide, please? And uh, so on behalf of Joop, I thank you for attention. We will um, correct this. There will be, we will make a new recording and this will be um, built in into or added as a link so that everyone who took the time to participate uh, will have also the account on behalf of the patients. Um, this is live. I want to hand over back to, to Roger, um, who skillfully has been leading this group since uh, not only a few weeks, since a few months now. Um, and he has insight in the questions which uh, came in and he will moderate the Q&A. Roger, please. Thank you very much, Bart. Um, so the, the, we have had several questions around one topic which Aaron decided he did, did, did not wish to talk about. This question, namely of steroids. And I, I realize we have um, several uh, uh, several members of the panel who um, may well have an opinion regarding this. So um, maybe we can start a little discussion around um, the safety of, um, first of all, epidural steroids in um, the current circumstances and whether there is a preference for a uh, particular steroid, so thinking particularly the differences between um, dexamethasone and me maybe um, something like um, methylprednisolone. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Aaron, seeing as you, seeing as you were brave enough to mention steroids in the first place. I think you may be on mute. Hello, Aaron. Aaron, you're unmuted or muted. Sylvia, do you? Yeah, I, I, I talk. Can you hear me? Yes. So uh, I, I, we haven't changed our practice. We are using, we are uh, back to using uh, epidural steroid uh, injection on, based on the same uh, guidelines that we, we, we used uh, uh, before. And this is probably the biggest uh, request from our patients to come back to have uh, in cases of acute uh, uh, lum lumbar pain syndromes to have uh, this kind of uh, interventions. We haven't seen any problems with our patients, and even we, we find out that, uh, regard of safety, dexamethasone is not uh, bad; it's even good for our patients. So I I can't see nowadays, based on what we know today, that uh, we are um, doing any damage to uh, in, to our uh, patients or are putting them at risk of having a, any bad uh, problem with uh, COVID uh, infection. I don't know if you have any other uh, opinion. 
Aaron. Aaron is mute. Um, while Aaron is looking for the button, is your uh, microphone button green or red, Aaron? If it's red, then you're muted. Okay, it's green. Uh, thank you. Um, nevertheless, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe I can comment also. There was uh, a, there was a phase where there was a lot of confusion because of some some um, reporting in the literature. And for a very short time, we disclosed or we had a shared decision making with our patients, uh, uh, discussing with them that there was um, confusion that we cannot, uh, at that stage, couldn't give any guidance. And so we left, um, uh, took the decision to um, have this open discussion, especially in the frail patients, which were considered as COVID um, risk patients. Or, um, and nevertheless, um, also our referral colleagues uh, mostly asked to reconsider this after we did the injections without uh, the corticosteroids. And nowadays, we're now on normal track. We get, do give uh, dexamethasone and we do give methylprednisone for the normal uh, procedures as, uh, as, as, as uh, we usually did. Maybe we can try again to for Aaron. Aaron, uh, well, are... one, one point. I don't know today nowadays there be any difference between dexamethasone and methylprednisone regarding the the prognosis of our patients. If you, I don't know. We mm -hmm. don't have any research coming on, and so we are using the same common practice and guidance that used before. Thank yeah. you, Aaron. Can we hear you this time? Yes. Apologies, guys. I'm, I mean, it was green, but um, I couldn't. Um, I thought it was central. So anyway, I've logged. It's, it's fine. Thank you. So, thank you for. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, I mean, again, I was mentioning um, the reason I didn't want to discuss much about CRR is the commonest question people ask. And I go back to the question that other than inflammatory conditions like acute radicular pain or seropositive arthritis, the evidence for steroids is not particularly strong, even though we all use it. Now, I find that we, we have an opportunity to look at our practice, number one. Number two is that steroids, we talk about herd immunity, we talk about reduction in immune system, all those things, but also steroids can suppress your um, paraxial response. So we have to be judicious in using it. Now, the counter argument is that the, that is partly due to British government telling about dexamethasone is the new wonder drug for COVID. We all knew that it works in uh, intensive care patients uh, with uh, systemic inflammatory responses. But um, again, I would go by if you want to use it, use it, but use it judiciously. You know, if people use steroids for middle branch blocks, people use uh, for peripheral nerve blocks, they put steroids in. We really have to question that. But if you have an acute radicular pain, or then again, use very specific uh, transforaminals to deal with it. But again, use the lowest dose possible and use it judiciously. Uh, I'm not very keen on people doing steroid injections because that's been their traditional practice. I think we should revisit our practice and um, look at what is the best possible way forward. And again, it's not just about the injection. It is doing the pain relief and then making sure that the patient gets proper rehabilitation, input from physiotherapy, input from rehab specialists, et cetera. So we need to work together in that delivering that package, which I told about. Thank you. Um, we'd like to change topics and have a, quiz, a question specifically for Mary. Um, do you feel you can remotely assess movement and disability of a patient with arth uh, hip arthritis in order to um, reassure yourself regarding whether there has been um, uh, pro uh, progress in terms of uh, outcomes or deterioration of the condition? Um, and also, are you aware of any specific packages um, such as videos um, with a series of um, uh, uh, movements that one can can use to provide such a service. 
Yeah, so mainly for people with hip OA, the current disability and quality of life measures are generally self-report. So you can give people questionnaires online that they can complete and you can follow their progress using those measures. Um, regarding range of motion, I'm not fully sure in hip OA patients. There are some goniometers that people can use using apps. I'm not sure how reliable and valid they are. So I'm not fully able to answer that question. But I also have access to some libraries of videos um, that I would be able to share. I could probably share after this meeting that we could share as part of the webinar to give people access to exercise videos. So there would be some for hip pain, knee pain, back pain. So that's possible. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, I have got one, we've got time for one final question and I think I'm going to direct this one initially to uh, uh, Louis, if that's all right. This is a participant from Brazil. Um, and do you think it's a good idea to prevent COVID-19 in chronic patients with drugs such as Invermectin or another drug? I think I think you're on mute. Say so green. Okay, uh, that's <laughs> that's all. Uh, no, what I what I think it's um, important is to try to control any kind of uh, new device you use or new procedure you use or new. Uh, way of uh, changing things just against some gold standard and this is uh, real for questionnaires is really real for apps or for literature simply uh, not just have a good idea and try to implement it but just have a good idea and try the, it against something and just see whether this uh, th there is some added value of your good idea i think that this is a very transversal thing that can be applied to questionnaires or to dexamethasone injections, I mean, to, to anything you have. And if we can convey this idea for uh, people that are the, the colleagues that are uh, hearing us and discussing with us, I think this would be a, a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to hand back to um, Bart to conclude this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. I want to thank uh, the whole faculty for their contribution. I do want to apologize for the technical issues we we had, although the, the dry run went well. Um, what I heard during this uh, webinar is that actually in looking at uh, what's happening in the professional care of chronic pain patients during this pandemic, that we're facing quite common issues. That um, and I, I, especially if I look at decisions made in different countries, that most of our, the majority of our peers and colleagues from different healthcare perspective, uh, physicians, allied healthcare professionals, actually were taking the same measures also independently from each other. And so that's, that's uh, it's a good, good sign that we have a common knowledge and that we have a common pragmatic approach to dealing with these types of, of crisis. Of course, um, there are major issues in the, the healthcare uh, perspective, especially during the lockdown period. Um, and what we noticed uh, from the survey of the, the Pain Alliance uh, Europe is that there were major challenges, but we are well prepared now um, because new ways of offering care to uh, our patients are now accelerated and many um, initiatives towards e-medicine, e-health, m-health were already on track but now we're really witnessing an acceleration of all these new uh, uh, forms of uh, offering therapy in also a virtual world and this is something which will stick around also post-COVID I'm quite convinced. Um, it was 
briefly raised by by Aaron. I also do expect, and and I heard this also. This is also the opinion of many colleagues. Although COVID is affecting mainly the respiratory system, and if we look also in the care of palliative care um, settings, that pain is in most settings not a major complaint, it, it can be, we need to be aware that there will be an increase in this chronic widespread pain um, after a crisis. This has been shown in history that long ongoing crisis, whatever cause it is, war, major social um, changes uh, around will lead to an increase and we should be uh, aware of this. So this, and that's the reason I think it's important that we continue also our task force um, and that this is not something we, which we will stop once the vaccine will be there. I think it's worthwhile to continue also watching what are the long-term consequences of COVID. So I want to uh, thank all the participants from the five continents over the world. At a certain moment, we were over 20, 20, uh, 220 active participants. Um, all those who were registered will have access and we will take care that you will have also a proper presentation of the patient uh, survey. Um, actually, we are moving, uh, you know, um, for those who are common with uh, the European Pain Federation, my presidential campaign over the last three years went about uh, ethic on the move and we will move now into the virtual world. And I'm very uh, pleased and, and it's, it's a great, great pleasure to announce that we will have quite a big event in fall 2020. Um, this will be uh, more um, a virtual educational summit and I want to end my words of thank to the whole faculty and the participants with a short video so uh, like they say in the publicity stay tuned for a few moments and I take care of yourself and hope to see you back on this event um, and I can guarantee you there will be a complete different um, background, technical background than our uh, webinar today. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start the video. Hi everyone, this is Melinda from EPIC. I'm here today with current president Bart Morion and president-elect Brona Fullen to find out more about the Global Pain Education Summit presented by the European Pain Federation. Bart, can you tell us what is the Global Pain Education Summit? Yeah, thank you, Melinda. Indeed, the, the Global Pain Education Summit will be the biggest online uh, educational event in 2020 on the topic of pain. And we will go offer over 40 hours in two days. That's amazing. Uh, Brona, is this virtual event only for physicians? Uh, no, Melinda, we have designed 10 hours of discipline specific tracks for physiotherapists, for nurses, for psychologists, as well as for physicians. I suppose this reflects the various members of the healthcare team who assess and treat people with pain. We've also included five hours of interprofessional education. And I suppose this is to integrate knowledge between members of the healthcare team, because we know that working collaboratively and sharing responsibility for patients' care ultimately improves their outcomes. Wonderful. So Bart, how does this event tie in with the European Pain Federation pain curricula and exam? Oh, our educational summit will tie in very nicely with the existing curricula of the European Pain Federation. We have curri a curriculum for physicians, for physiotherapists, for uh, clinical psychology and nursing. And so if you would consider taking our exams or, or uh, preparing these exams, uh, following this uh, online event will, would be a very nice prep course. That's good to know. So Bruno, now how can I find out more? All the information about our summit, Melinda, can be found on our website, europeanpainfederation.eu. Uh, Why not uh, subscribe to the newsletter and you'll get immediate notification when tickets for the summit become available. 
That's excellent. Thank you both so much for your time, and we can't wait to learn more. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.